All right, um, our final area of questions is sort of a, a potpourri area, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. um, excuse me for skipping around a little bit. Is this bit. the speed round? Is that <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, we're, we're doing pretty well on time, so I don't know okay. that we have to rush. Um, a couple years ago, TriMet received a grant to put uh, a regenerative braking uh, energy storage system on, I think, 20 MAX vehicles. What's the progress on that? Actually, we had a pilot installation um, more earlier this year. Um, my, my understanding is we're monitoring it and uh, it's progressing well. Um, I haven't had a full report on it. It's um, some of our vehicle engineers continue to work with it. It was the kind of thing where I think there was going to be a certain level of tweaking associated with it. Um, and so that tweaking was going on with the prototype installations that they had. But moving ahead and will be in place before long. Okay, I'm sure our readers would love to hear about it. Um, question that comes up probably every time you do service planning. Um, Today we have an Alder Washington couplet, uh, I'm sorry, an Alder uh, Salmon Washington couplet. Right. Uh, very far apart. Uh, people keep asking, why couldn't we do Alder Washington instead? Well, that's a really excellent question and uh, probably goes to more history than I have about <laughs> why these, these routes are on this particular streets they have. I do know that, that the 15 for, that, that we're talking about here, mm -hmm. the number 15 line also serves um, the uh, Goose Hollow station well. And there's a lot of transferring that goes on between the 15 bus line and the max line. Um, and so then, as you s once you get that far where you're really providing a, a close uh -huh. transfer connection to the west side uh, portion of the max line, then Salmon is about the first street you get to that heads east. Uh, so that's one notion. Um, and, you know, the other consideration I think we've got is that um, Alder is a pretty busy street. Um, a lot of businesses, a lot of parking. It's kind of an on-ramp to the bridge uh, mm -hmm. at one end. So I think there'd have to be a little bit of research and study about whether or not it's worthy of really looking at. I, I'll ask service planning the question again, though, to actually look at that. I guess the other observation I've got is there's a pretty excellent couple at one block over at Morris and Yamhill, or two blocks over uh -huh. at Morris and Yamhill, which um, I, I think serve uh, that east-west travel through downtown uh -huh. pretty pretty well. It's almost a moving sidewalk of trains these days with all the, the different really with the combination of lines on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, TriMet's been a pioneer in real-time arrival uh, and services around that. Certainly, I've personally participated in some of the software development around that. Uh, but a question we get is that um, while the buses have GPS, uh, as I understand that the predictions for the MAX trains come from circuits in the tracks yes. and are not always as accurate. Right. Uh, our, our readers would like to know, is there a prospect for better accuracy on the MAX arrival predictions? Great question, and I'm afraid I don't know the answer. Um, but I would tell you that in the, over the, the rest of this calendar year, we will be uh, uh, updating our uh, AVL system mm -hmm. and our radio system on the bus system. So rather than having what is now, I think, about a satellite update every three minutes, we'll be compressing that. It will be even shorter. So for the buses themselves, we will be getting more accurate information here out to customers probably by the end of the year. That's combined with another one of our major, frankly, reinvestments in the bus system, which is a new uh, automatic dispatch system, new radio system, and um, new um, new consoles on the on the uh, buses themselves. Part of that, um, again later this year, we'll begin to see um, a new uh, printer for transfers as well. And one of our long-term, um, we'll let people say, well, how come you have, um, as I call it, the best of the 19th century technology <laughs> for our current transfers on the bus, whereas we have much more um, elaborate um, printing devices for the Macs, and this will begin to equalize between the modes, and I think will actually be a great uh, asset, both for our riders and for our, our operators in particular, who now have to be careful how they tear that little piece of paper. Okay, mm -hmm. and our last question is also a technology question. Um, Last month, you released uh, a white paper on electronic fare technologies. Yes. Uh, what's the timeline in which our readers can look forward to seeing some of that technology deployed? Well, believe it or not, it's probably about five years. Um, th later this year, and the budget does include a little bit of a, of a stipend for this, is that we'll be uh, releasing an RFP looking for some technical assistance for us. Meanwhile, we'll be, uh, we continue our conversations with many others in the transit, many of our peers in the transit industry. And this is a really uh, hot topic in transit industry uh, nationwide. 
Um, I think one of the great advantages of moving from, as I say, from the 19th century to now, um, the, the cutting edge technology that's out now, is we'll be skipping the whole generations of technology and the old smart card technologies that, frankly, a couple of years ago, we would have thought was cutting edge, may not be cutting edge by the time um, we actually implement this. Um, but believe it or not, five years is probably about as fast as we can do this, just given the need to develop the specification carefully, uh, to be do some research with some of the different uh, providers to actually uh, begin to prototype some things and, uh, and then do the actual procurements related to the contract and the installation. I'd also expect that as we start, we would do um, some pilot projects where we might not do the whole system all at once. We'd, we'd try a, a segment of it, maybe give uh, Portland Transport readers uh, access to it and, and TriMet employees and um, begin to see uh, how it works for a subset before we make it ubiquitous across the system. Um, it's a big deal. There's nothing more um, difficult for a transit agency than fair technology because it, it, it is literally touches every element of uh, our operation, from our operations to our finance division to the legal division to the IT division. It takes incredible coordination and communication to be able to pull this off well. We're committed to doing that. And as you know, I've, I've sort of made this a bit of a priority that we begin to really focus on this as an agency. So what do you see as some of the key benefits for riders from the transition to electronic fare? Well, I think ease will be one. First of all, I, if one is using either um, a, a proximity credit card or a near phone, um, near field connection from a, a cell phone, I think it'll be very easy for both um, um, regular riders as well as occasional riders to use the system. Um, the other thing is I think well, there will be some advantages in terms of um, fare evasion and I think we'll be able to catch it because what happens in these systems is you walk on the bus, you flash your uh, device and you get a green light or a red light and it's very clear and there's no level of interpretation on the part of the operator about whether or not the fare instrument is right because the computer uh, defines the rules in, in that regard. So I think there's some advantage, uh, some advantage to that as well which will reduce the leakage, I guess you can say, in the current fare system. Um, I also think that there will be incredible advantages to us, um, those of us who think about planning and transit development in terms of information that will be available. We can get, we get incredible origin destination data uh, from those systems that I think will be very, very helpful to planning systems in the future. So I think there are some really substantial benefits. Uh, another one, and I've asked our project staff for the Portland Milwaukee project to look at this is whether or not we can begin to prototype a closed station design uh, much like you see at the Washington Metro or New York City uh, subway and to begin to prototype that at the Bybee station uh, on the Portland Milwaukee line and that might be a prototype for other stations in suburban areas particularly where there's uh, um, the access is, uh, we can actually constrain the access to those stations. So only paid um, fare holders can access the platform of the station. So if, if I recall the City Club discussion, I think you got that question at City Club about open versus closed platforms, and you mm -hmm. made the point that certainly in the central city, the stations are just part of the urban fabric and it would be very hard to segregate them. So is right. there uh, a value to being able to close some system, some stations without being able to close all of them? I think there is. I, I think, um, you know, for example, some of the stations that where they're a bit removed from the street, like along the band field, I think people would feel more secure if they knew only other fair paying passengers mm -hmm. were there. Um, and while we have done a lot of work in terms of cameras and lights, I think the, the access control would be one additional uh, improvement related to security. And I think in some of those situations, you know, frankly, just making sure everybody who's at a able to access the train or get off the train because it's the same situation uh, has paid is um, will help with the leakage question that, that I raised earlier. So uh, we're talking about the benefits of potentially closing some platforms. Right. Uh, I think in the past, 82nd Avenue has been a suggested location. Uh, for security reasons for that. Um, any comment on whether that would fit within this scheme? It would uh, in the future. I might note that we've uh, completed a, a pilot project for 82nd Avenue working with the neighborhood um, and Portland Police and 
uh, the Portland Department of Transportation and ODA, all part of that. Um, and what we did is improve lighting. We made sure that the platforms were clearly marked as fair paid zone that allow our, uh, both our fair inspectors and the transit police to do more inspection to make sure that people who are on the platform are, um, are do, do have a legitimate fare and le i.e. a legitimate reason to be there. So a number of improvements were taken, uh, had taken place, but it, that's a little different than having the closed physical barrier, physical barrier and we uh, obviously just don't have the technology in our fare system to allow that right now and that would be the innovation that we look to uh, improve. Okay, I'd like to thank you very much for sharing this time with our readers. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat>